New Orleans Food Memories is made possible by the WYS Producer Circle, a group of generous contributors dedicated to the support of WYS's local productions. Major corporate funding is provided by Beauty and Strength. In New Orleans, you can find both in our centuries-old live oaks and in the wrought iron that graces many of our neighborhoods. Whitney Bank, wrought iron strong since 1883. Local flavor since 1956. And by contributions to WYS from viewers like you. Thank you. We really did have chicken andouille gumbo one day a week. We really did have seafood gumbo one day a week, and they were two completely different things. and bread pudding and lost bread and all of those things that uh, just sound almost much too much to be real, but we really did eat it. This was, this was what we grew up with. We used to eat something also called Creole cream cheese. Of course, we just called it cream cheese back then. We would put sugar in it and bread. Put the sugar and bread in, mix it up a little bit, and it would eat it like, it, it was very nice, it was a sour dish, but it was an acquired taste and we all loved it. We'd go out fishing, we'd bring the fish home, and if it was speckled trout, the mom would cook it. And the smell of brown butter and almonds kind of wafting through the house and smelling that, I think, is probably the most vivid and perhaps the earliest food memory that I have. Peggy Scott Laborde. It's so easy to take local dishes for granted. Seafood, fresh fruit and vegetables, all within easy reach. Anyone who has spent time in New Orleans likely has great memories of that first poor boy, that first bowl of gumbo. Let's look back at some of those special moments, thanks to our local cuisine. I have Local vegetables, including okra, are common ingredients in many New Orleans recipes. When I was a child, I never understood why the movie theater didn't have fried okra as opposed to popcorn. That's how much I loved okra, I swear to you. And still to this day, I'm trying to get my kids to love it as much as I do. I know a lot of people even who grew up here find okra too slimy. I love it. It's one of the most interesting foods to me in general. I mean, it's beautiful looking. This pod with these perfect ridges and a little cap and a tip, and it almost is too perfect to even cut up. And I, I like pretty much in every version. The name gumbo comes from one of the African words in the Bantu tongue for okra, keen gumbo, very important ingredient, but always at my grandparents' house. There was always fresh okra steamed and served with a vinaigrette. That's how we had it, plenty, plenty, sometimes smothered. In Spanish-speaking countries, it's known as chayote. In some English-speaking countries, vegetable pear, but we call it how many ways are there to say meloton? Meloton? No Thanksgiving is complete without meloton. To stuff them with um, seafood dressing, little shrimp, crab meat, lots of onions, celery, a little bit of bell pepper, and uh, lots of Italian breadcrumbs stuffed into the meloton, into the oven, bake them. 
Lord have mercy, they're so good. One thing that I find really unique about New Orleans is the, the stuffed culture. People love stuffing things here, artichokes, shrimp, meat, meliton or merliton. And most of the time, the stuffing in you know whatever dish you're making involves a lot of breadcrumbs. We had meliton all the time, and uh, it surprised me to see how it grew because meliton was something, how we grew it, uh, was on the fence. It was a, it's a vine vegetable, I guess you would call it. And I learned later down that, that, that some people know Merlin tones. Never knew what a Merlin tone was. It was Merlin tone. My mother never liked anything that came from nature. She wanted it from Swagman's. <laughs> I remember my daddy grew tomatoes and she refused to eat them because they were coming out of the ground. <laughs> So she always liked her stuff wrapped and uh, coming from swagmas, never from trees and vines and all that stuff. <laughs> One native dish is so popular it even has its own day of the week, Monday. Local legend is that red beans and rice was a dish that could be left to simmer for hours while the lady of the house did the laundry. This dish is also inexpensive to make as one New Orleans-born jazz legend who grew up poor vividly recalls. Mama could cook a pot of red beans and rice, uh, 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 cubion, uh, grill gumbo, all that stuff, and she could take 15 cents and make the biggest pot of you ever had. People don't know how to do that today, do they? Well, they got some of them. Yeah. Yeah, if they get out of work, they're fine. Got to stretch 15 from, cents. Oh, from New Orleans, anybody can, can cook a, with a little money. On concert tours, Armstrong even traveled with a supply of red beans and rice and signed his letters, Red Beans and Ricely Yours. Right, everybody made them different, especially in the Third Ward because you had people from the country living there, you had people from the right in New Orleans living there. It was like a, a, a mesh of things. And you had people, Cuban people, I mean, it was a real hip blend of people. The choices of meat to accompany the dish depended on your pocketbook. Pickle meat was the best though, because pickle meat, it's like the backbone and you know, the, the least expensive cut of the pig, and they just kind of pickle it slightly. You make do with what you got. Today, the dish remains a staple in many a local household. Every Monday I eat red beans and rice. My children eat red beans and rice, they have no choice. I've made a deal with my wife and she eats red beans and rice on Monday. Our children are going to be brought up knowing who they are and where they come from. One thing about red beans is everyone has his condiment that, that he would put in it. I'm afraid mine was ketchup. I grew out of that. You know, I know people who put chow chow, mustard. When the calendar says it's Holy Thursday, for Mrs. Leah Chase, proprietor and chef of Dookie Chase's restaurant, it's the busiest day of the year. This restaurateur is about to serve the pre-Easter dish she grew up with and shares the traditions that come along with it. Gumbo Zab is a green gumbo. And being um, superstitious as we supposed to be in New Orleans, uh, we use uneven numbers of greens, five, seven, nine, or 11. I use nine. And we do that because they said even numbers, bad luck, you can't do that. You have to use the uneven numbers. And they used to say too, old Creole say, you will acquire a new friend for every green I have in the pot. It was a delicious dish because it, it really was, uh, you would forget that you were eating greens as a kid. Uh, <laughs> and just thought you were eating some sort of exotic gumbo, basically. Gumbo represents a melting pot of cultures, French, Spanish, West African, and Native Indian. While most are made with seafood or chicken and sausage, the ingredients can vary. I love everything from gumbo zab to uh, puldu gumbo. Each one of them is very unique, and I think each, each gumbo truly, if it's made from the heart, tells a story. Kenneth Palmer grew up in and around families that were on a tight budget. So Miss Teresa Isaac, when she made her gumbo, she'd put wieners in it. She'd buy a whole pack of wieners, and she cut those wieners up, and well, wieners went in liquid, they float. So when you, you know, and, you know, and everybody shared it. 
So they had the wieners in it, and the, the gravy was a little, it was a different color. My mother's uh, gumbo was sort of on the darkish green side from the filet, whereas Miss Isaac's gumbo was kind of on the brownish side, but it was very good. Some early dining memories originated on the bayous. The thing we had on Easter Sunday was what we call kawan. It's a snapping turtle stew. Always had that because in spring is when the turtles came out, so they were plentiful. And the, the big prize with kawan is when you cut the turtle shell and you clean them out. I didn't eat it, but a lot of people, there were the, the undeveloped eggs inside the female turtle. So you would cook that too and eat that uh, like, well you made stew out of it. It was, it was turtle stew or turtle soup, but you made a big stew out of it and the eggs were so, something like the, the fat, the yellow and crabs, that's what the eggs were. Unlike turtles, crawfish are plentiful, but one dish made from the critters is practically extinct. Crawfish bisque. The reason that it's almost gone is you have to find somebody who wants to actually touch that crawfish head seven times from the time that you pick it after it's boiled and, t and clean the head and stuff it. The old-fashioned way of making crawfish bisque is starting with the live crawfish. And I decided that I wanted to do that. I went through the purging process in my front yard um, where you, you soak the crawfish or, or make them swim around a little bit in a saltwater bath to sort of clean out their intestinal tract. And you kind of have to stir them around. I used a broomstick and a couple got free and one attached itself to my hand and their claws are, they really work, I can tell you that. And um, I did scream when that crawfish <laughs> latched onto my hand. And I can't tell you how many city dwellers describe for me starting off their crawfish bisque by purging the crawfish in the bathtub. And I have clear memories of my aunt's third story apartment in the French Quarter on Royal Street with the bathtub filled with crawfish. An important distinction in local cooking is Creole versus Cajun. Cajun food is your country food. And this is the food from the Kissin' Cousins way out in southwest Louisiana. The food is spicier generally and it's also one pot meals as opposed to being beautifully finished things with sauces. In Cajun country, the food is all about the pig and the chicken and the seafood is a special event. Creole food is the food of the city of New Orleans. It is our indigenous cuisine. It is really the first indigenous American cuisine that came from the blending of the Spanish, the French, and the Africans. One dish that doesn't fit into any of those categories is an example of cultures blending in more recent times. I tend to pronounce it phonetically Yakamane, although I most people um, who make and eat the dish regularly say something that sounds more like yakami. Most widely um, available variation is based on sort of a, a bouillon type broth, like a, a, a kind of beef, beefy, very thin broth. Um, and then it's a soup that contains spaghetti noodles, some kind of meat. You had charlotte's in it, which us old folks know it's charlotte's, new people might call it green onions. It was a noodle in it, and you definitely had to have a boiled egg in it. And it was all mixed together. It was fantastic. You couldn't eat it with a spoon. You had to eat it with a fork because of the noodles. And when you got down to the sauce, the, the juice of it, you would just turn it up and drink it like a regular drink. Theories of the origin of the dish are as varied as its ingredients. Locally, it's found in Asian-owned neighborhood grocery stores and small restaurants in primarily black neighborhoods and also in black bars. People who had a hangover always were looking for yakamen. <laughs> or before they went home, after a night of heavy drinking, they would stop somewhere and get yakamen so they wouldn't get a hangover. So I always had it in mind with a sort of medicinal <laughs> remedy. A true New Orleans staple is the poor boy. Or is it poor boy? 
roast beef, oyster, shrimp, ham and cheese, whatever your preference, the poor boy is one of the city's culinary contributions that embellishes a universal dish, the sandwich. One way the sandwich got its name can be traced to an event that took place in the 1920s. I say poor boy and I'll tell you why. The, it is well known that the originators of the poor boy sandwich were Benny and Clovis Martin, who owned Martin's Restaurant on the corner of St. Claude and Turo back into the 20s. They were certainly around when the streetcar strike started, everybody knows this story, that they, they made the sandwiches and originally without meat on them except for the meat that was in the gravy. It was basically a debris sandwich. And they would sell these or give them away as the case seemed to justify to the striking streetcar workers for either free or a nickel. They were very inexpensive, but they were filling and they were good. And they were named for the poor boys that were out on the, uh, out on the picket lines. And I started eating at Martin's Poor Boy Restaurant back in the early 1970s when I was going to college until they closed in 1973. I was there about two, three days before they went out of business. And the name on the sign was Martin's Poor, new word, boy, restaurant. On their menu, they called them Poor Boys. They invented it. They get to say how it's spelled and pronounced. I say Poor Boy because that's how I thought you were supposed to say it. That's what I heard most when I came to town. And that's what all the signs said. I know there are good arguments for saying poor boy, but it took me so long to be able to say po boy that, that I just, I can't go back. The essential ingredient to the poor boy is French bread. New Orleans style French bread is lighter, less dense. What makes it unique? Explanations vary, but they include the use of local water, climate, and lots of skill. The Martin brothers, to get more out of a loaf, decided they needed a slightly different shape from typical French bread, thick in the middle with pointed ends. They turned to baker John Gendusa for help. Inspired by a shape he saw in his native Sicily, he created a loaf of uniform size with rounded ends. The Gendusas are still baking New Orleans French bread. And I think it's remarkable and typical that in New Orleans you've got Italians or Leidenheimer, Germans, baking French bread. But that's because this is the original melting pot. While there are still plenty of places today to order a poor boy, one from the past left quite an impression